house of the Lord today. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer today, and we're just going to welcome him into this house. I'm so glad that this is a day that the Lord has made and that he has given us this opportunity to praise him. How many is thankful for that today? Oh, I'm so glad that God has given us life not only has he given us life, but he's given us health today so that we can just come into this house and worship him. If you're here today and you have a special need, would you just make it known by the raising of your hand all over the house? God knows what that need is, and we're going to take it to him right now with faith in our hearts, knowing that God is a miracle working God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we come to you right now. God, we're so thankful that we have this moment. We're thankful that we have this time of being in your house to be able to worship you, to be able to praise you, to be able to magnify you today, God. I'm asking you right now, every hand that was raised signifying a situation that you, oh God, would go to the scene right now. Move, do the supernatural. The things that are impossible with man are possible with you in the name of Jesus right now healing virtue deliverance in the name that is above every name we speak it right now in Jesus name amen amen now we're going to be here for the next well that's how many pages of notes that Ange has I think there's like 40 or 50 pages so we might be here an hour hour and a half Two hours, maybe. I don't know. But so what I'm trying to say is you're going to be sitting by that person for just a little bit, okay? You get what I'm saying today? Here's what I want you to do. If you're comfortable with it, if you're our guest, you don't have to do this. Home folks, I ask you to. Would you reach over and grab your neighbor by the hand? And I wonder if you would just raise that hand to the heaven. And I want you to pray one for another right now that God's anointing, God's power, God's freedom would just touch our hearts uh, and touch our lives. Uh, God, right now we're assembled in this house. Uh, we have come into this place to worship you, uh, to praise you, uh, to adore you, uh, to lift our voices uh, in one accord, uh, to make one sound to be heard uh, in praising and worshiping you. Uh, now, God, you know the need of the hand that I hold. Uh, you know the situation uh, that a person that is standing beside me. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would touch today, that you would move this morning, that you would heal this very second. God, I'm asking you right now that God, we have not come to go through a series of psalms and a word. But God, we have come to enter into your gates. God, we have come to enter into your courts. God, we've come to lift up our hands unto you. We've come to magnify you and praise you and worship you because you are holy. You are holy. You are righteous. You are magnificent. And we thank you today for your goodness. In the name of Jesus, we adore you. We bow before you. We cry out holy unto your name. We're asking you to minister in our service right now. Meet with us in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles. I would love for you to turn with us to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, we will begin to read from verse 1 through 9. We will be reading from the New King James Version. If you do not have that version, we will provide it on the screen for you. All right, thank you so much. This is now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and sudden other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, 
two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Oh, don't you love the Word of God? Today is Mission Sunday. And of course, today we're going to pray for our missionaries around the world. Uh, this church supports many, many missionaries. And I'm so thankful that we are a church that loves missions. Uh, and today we're going to pray for our missionaries. Uh, and we're going to pray not only for them, but for their families. Uh, God's anointing upon them and that God to use them uh, in the field that he has sent them to. To give them a harvest uh, at this end time. Uh, would you stretch your, for your hands towards these flags? Uh, and why don't we pray right now for our missionaries? God, uh, we come to you right now. Uh, we're asking you this very moment, Lord, uh, that you would come down and touch our missionaries touch their families touch their children God the field that they are laboring in I pray right now that God you would give them souls for their labor I pray God that you would anoint them and open the right doors and close the wrong doors I pray God increase into each and every one of their ministries I ask this over our missionaries around the world today we pray in jesus name and everybody say amen how many realizes it's not a debt that i owe but it's what it's a seed i get a sow i don't owe this i get a sow this right and there's a difference in that and so i would love for you to get out your ties I'd love for you to get out your offerings right now. Would you do that all over the house? Just get out your tithes. Get out your offering. Some of you pay by app and you pay by phone. So just raise your phone, okay? Just raise your phone up high. And here's what I want you to do. Would you repeat after pastor? Say, God, I give back to you what you have given to me. Here's the key. With a joyful heart. I give it back to you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, here's what we do at the Life Church for all of our guests. We march and we bring our tithes and offerings. So we go row by row. So the front row will come. We go out the right side, come back in through the left. Let's bring our tithes and let's bring our offerings unto the Lord. Lost in chain, could not get past my flame until he come my
tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am.
Yes, I will be grateful because you have been faithful. Yes, you have. I will be grateful because you have been faithful.
hope today because God called our names. I'm so thankful to be here on a Sunday morning. Why don't you just uh, take your hand, put it on your head, Lord, anoint my mind, anoint my heart, let your word go forth and let it be received. And when we leave this place, be glorified in Jesus' name. Thank you for being here this morning. Thankful pastor is home and I honor him. The only reason I speak is because he believes in me and he apparently thinks that I have something to share with you. So I'm going to do my best. I see the time. But if you live here in Manny and you drive to Shreveport, you spend longer than you're going to be in church. So uh, I just come up here every service, giving it my best, because if this is the last time I speak, I want to go out strong. If this is the last time you ever have to hear me, listen, I don't want to leave anything left. So I'm just going to give it to you. So grab your pens, your Bibles, your phones, whatever you take notes on. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today because you have a powerful God. Isaiah 40 that we just saw a little clip about quickly turns our focus from everything else, from all of our discomfort, our discouragement, and our troubles, and it causes us to ponder how awesome our sovereign God is. He's the only true, powerful God. This chapter begins with a message of comfort and redemption from the Lord. Then it points to the coming of Christ and the good news. So when you're reading Isaiah 40, go back home and read it. Please don't do it right now. Go back home and read it. But it's pointing to what we celebrated last week. He then directs us to consider the vastness and the wisdom of God in all that he had promised. Isaiah chapter 40, 12 to 14 says, Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and the hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? Is there anyone here today that God's ever asked you how to do it right? Is there anyone in this room that can measure the heavens with the span of your hand? Because that's what King James tells us. To mark off the heavens with the span of his hand means between his little finger and his thumb, when it's outstretched, the palms open and the fingers not touching. So why don't you just go ahead and do this right here. Make sure your fingers are not touching. Your hand might be able to encompass a piece of paper, a book, a tissue box, or a phone. But God's hand spans the universe. My girl Jen, one time, whenever we're shopping for family weekend and different things, we have to get these big buckets of uh, either the beans or the nacho cheese or the big, the big jar cans. Have you all seen those, like you get them at Walmart or at Sam's, but they're like this big? And Jen Thornton can literally grab the can. And no joke, she can grab the can, that, that big one that's like this, with her one hand. I wasn't able to, but she could. And I was like, wow, that's pretty incredible. But God just spans the whole earth, the universe, with his hand. You might have showed up this morning feeling hopeless, but I showed up this morning to bring you a message that Jesus Christ is your living hope. Everyone in this room will face seasons and chapters in life that you do not feel that you have much hope. You will face times of discouragement and you will go through times when you feel like your faith is slipping. Occasionally, we might even feel like God don't hear our prayers. We know he can, but we don't think he's listening. Sometimes we feel like our circumstances are too small for him to notice or they're too big for him to handle. We might not actually say that out loud, but most of us have probably had those thoughts at times. So instead of you feeling condemned this morning for those thoughts, I want to encourage you that you do have hope in a God who's not too small and he's not too big and there's nothing he cannot handle. If he can hold the universe with his hand, he can hold you and all of your problems in the palm of his hand. 
In Genesis, we read the story of Abraham and Sarah. And if you've been in the church world long enough, then you know the story that God promises him a child and then he, that he would be a father of nations. So you've probably also heard jokes made when people, women, and around 40 or even after are expecting, there will be jokes that you're the new Abraham and Sarah. There were so many jokes made about me that I was going to be the modern day Sarah. The Lord finally, when I was 39, gave me an 11 year old. But we've made those jokes of Abraham and Sarah. In Sunday school, we've sung, sung the song, Father Abraham had what? Countless messages have been written and preached about Abraham, his impatience, his disappointments, his failures, him messing up, and, and then that one where he listened to his wife to take her handmaiden. We like to make jokes about that, we make messages about that, but there have been far more messages preached about Abraham and his faith than all of his failures. We read, first read about Abraham in Genesis 17. Before that, he was Abram. And Abram was mentioned 48 times from Genesis 11 to 17. After that, only two more times in the Bible will you ever find Abram referred to, and it's only because he's being referred to as Abraham. In Genesis 17 and 5, Abraham enters on the scene. It says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So I want to stop and pause here for a moment and tell you that when God calls you to be what he said you are, then you can go ahead and change your former name and you are not referred to that anymore. You're no longer called addicted, but you're called free. You're no longer called barren, but you're called fruitful. You're no longer called dirty, but you're called clean. You're no longer called rejected, but you're called chosen. Whatever name or adjectives that the enemy has told you to call yourself, I'm here to tell you that God said you are his. So God told Abraham he's never going to be called Abram again. And so you can search the scriptures. He's not. Because when God says he's changed you and changed your name, that's what he means. So from the time that he's Abraham all the way Till the end of the Bible, we read of Abraham 230 times. And 70 of those times are in found in 11 chapters of the New Testament. You'll never read about Abram, but you will read about Abraham. When God gives a promise, it will come to pass. Abraham had a promise of a son. He had a promise that he would be a father of many nations. God gave him that promise. And so as we read the story in Genesis, we find out that the promise did not come easy, it didn't come quickly, and it didn't come without struggle. Yet Abraham has been called a man of faith. When we get into Romans chapter 4, that chapter focuses on the faith of Abraham, and Paul quotes Genesis when he's reading Romans chapter 4 verse 3, stating that Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. You go on to read the chapter and you can find out that we don't earn our forgiveness, nor can we work to be justified. Both are a gift from God because of the work on the cross. Verse 10 then tells us that God declared Abraham righteous for his faith long before Abraham was ever circumcised. So obedience comes after faith. Don't say you have faith. If you're not obedient to God's word. We must believe God is God and that he can and will do what he says. So God tells Abraham he's going to be a father of many nations. And Abraham just simply believed God. Now unfortunately their situation and the conditions were not ideal for birthing a son. Let alone a nation. Because they were old. 100 years old is old. Now, I know people who would like to be a millennial. I think that would be cool, or a, not, it's not called a millennial, but they would like to live a, a century. I think that would be cool if we were still healthy, if we still had our right mind, if we could still get around on our own. He was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90. And I think all of us would agree in this place that 100 and 90 is a little too old to begin a family, 
let alone a nation. So if you and I are going to receive our promises, you have to have unwavering faith. The promise God gave you might only be five years old. But if he can cause a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman to give birth, he can make your five-year-old promise come to pass. So Romans 4, 16 to 17 says, So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, we have faith like Abraham. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the Lord, in God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. So whatever is dead in your life today, God can bring it back if it's for his purpose. Whatever you're needing and you don't have in your life today, God can create and make it come to pass. So to Sarah, to have a son at her old age was very humorous. Genesis 18 tells us that when the Lord appeared to Abraham and Sarah, that she laughed. Verse 11 to 15 says, Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also old. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. So Sarah was afraid and she denies it. Now before you bash her, you have two. Because God has promised you about a few little things, and we snicker and we're like, oh, I don't really think that's going to happen. Or maybe you don't even laugh about it, maybe you just gripe about it. But we sit, still say, no, we don't see that happening, but we sure don't want to be called out. And God said, yes, you did. He said, uh, no, you did. She says, I didn't. No, you did. God does see and hear, and this is why it better be so important to all of us, our thoughts. And our words play into our promise. So right in the face of the hard facts of life, despite his circumstances that he was old, despite that her womb is dead, Abraham believed. So we get to verse 18, and it says, Even when there was no reason for hope, hoping against hope, when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would be the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Even though he was old, he did not relinquish his faith. You get on to verse 20 to 22, it says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. Regardless of the stories you want to think about with Abraham, that he didn't have faith, that he messed up, we get to the New Testament, and God remembers he had faith. So if you want to see your promise come to pass, do you have Abraham's faith? Do you waver and let your faith get weak, or do you let it grow? If you're going to let something grow, you have to be intentional. You do not grow on accident. You have to give your faith, let it give glory to God, and you have to be fully convinced and confident that God is powerful enough to fulfill his promise. And because of that faith, he was counted righteous. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I ask you today, who in this room wants to please God? 
you're going to have to have faith. You don't get faith carelessly, casually, or conveniently. You get faith in the word of God. For Romans 10, 17 says that when faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You have to believe that you have hope. I prayed this prayer over you on Wednesday night, Romans 15, 13. says, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So I ask you again, what are you going through right now that requires that kind of hope in the face of the odds that you are seeing? What has God promised you that you're still waiting to see him fulfill? What prayers are still not answered? If you're praying prayers according to God's word, you have hope. Now, if you're just praying for more money, bigger houses, better bodies, more time to do your pleasures, you're praying the wrong things, and you're not guaranteed those things. But when you pray God's word, then you've got hope. We get to know that by the end of the story, Abraham did have that son. He was called Isaac, and Isaac means laugh, laughter. I love how there is so many details about God. He always, he'll get the last laugh. She laughed and denied it, and God just openly laughed by calling him Isaac. Isaac didn't, or rather, Abraham didn't know the end of the story. He didn't have Genesis to read like you and I do. He was walking it out every day. You and I get to see the faith. When we face obstacles, we try to figure it out before we ask God how to work it out. We carry our limitations over to God. So many of us are not able to fix it, so therefore we assume God is not able to fix it. Our friends and family are limited, so therefore we assume our Heavenly Father is limited. But God is not limited. Some of you need to get off the premises and start standing on His promises because His faith, His promise will come. So I want to share a New Testament story with you of how that you and I should actually live when we face obstacles and hardships. When you get into Acts chapter 4, now the Holy Ghost has already been poured out. Jesus has already risen. The day of Pentecost has already happened. They're going from house to house, small groups. They're doing all these things. The message is going. But they face, the apostles face some opposition and persecution for teaching the name of Jesus and telling the good news. So the council threatens them and bans them from preaching in Jesus' name. They really don't know what to do because they can tell that these men have been with Jesus. And things are happening, but they still don't like what's happening, so they don't know how to take care of it. So they now just tell them that they have to stop. So instead of leaving the court discouraged, down, and depressed, they went straight to the other believers. Some of you get bad news, and instead of going to like-minded faith believers, you run to media and post your terrible news. You run to your unbelieving friends and tell them how bad it is. You even run to those lifers who they don't really have faith. They just live the same way you do. And so therefore, neither one of you are getting better. But here's what the apostles did. Acts chapter 4, 23 to 24. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and they told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard this report, not a few... But all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. So if I was to tell you that we had a bad report, it would be God's will in this place today that all believers lifted their voices together in prayer. And here's what they say. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. And they start praying. You can go home and read that as well. They knew about what Jeremiah had written. They knew about what Isaiah had said. They knew the immensity of God. The believers didn't pray poor, pitiful prayers like, oh God, look what we did and look what's happening. They immediately started praising God for who he is. You and I, if we're the New Testament church, must start believing God is who he says. And we must start praising him accordingly. They, after they say all this, and they're telling God, you can go home and look at it. They're telling God all this that has happened and how God said it was going to happen. They get to verse 29. And now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us your servants great boldness 
in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And watch what happened. After this prayer, the meeting place shook. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They preached the word of God with boldness. The problem didn't change. They were still being persecuted. They were still being banned. They were still being fought for, for teaching it. They didn't ask to be free from that. They asked for boldness to preach the word. We're living on, I don't know, I'm not the prophetess. I just read the Bible and I just have heard and have seen that we're living in some last days. I see it. So you need to stop asking God to free you from the torment and just ask God to give you a boldness. Their first response was to tell God that they knew who he was, what he was capable of, what his word said, and then they asked him to take care of the problem and give him a boldness to preach the word. They didn't ask for a way out. They didn't pout and complain. They didn't curse God by saying, if this is what we get, then we're done. They just knew God was able. They knew God was who he said he is. If you and I want to be like the first century church, then you and I are going to have to start looking at all of our difficulties, all of our discouragement, very different than the way we look at them. And we're going to have to do what the apostles and the early church did. We're going to have to immediately go to God, tell him who he is, remind him that he knew about this, and then ask him to do the work. And then believe. Our problem is that we allow our circumstances to get in the way and to block our view. So to give you a visual, think about the sun. Now, I'm not a scientist, and I'm not into all that astrology, but I do find some of the things that God has created just absolutely breathtaking. My mind can't comprehend it, but scientists, I don't know how they figure this out, but we put trust in technology and whatever else they're figuring out, but they say that the sun is about 864,000 miles wide. That's what they say. Meaning it is 109 times wider than the earth that you live in. They also say if it was a hollow ball that a million earths could fit inside of the sun. It's pretty massive. In my personal opinion, I think they're probably as right as they can be. But I don't know that God let them get exact dimensions. It could even be bigger than that. So Friday, as I was studying, I wanted to test something because I heard this example and I wanted to test it out and it really is right. And I know that when you walk out of here today, some of you are going to try it. So for the sun to be as massive as it is, I took my little six inch phone and I held it up to the sun. So when I walked outside, it was extremely bright and sunny and it's very hard to look the sun in the eyes. You know that. And as I'm looking up, you know, you're squinting. But the moment I did this, I didn't see the sun. All I saw was some light coming around, but I didn't see the sun. This little six-inch phone blocked that 864,000-mile wide sun. Just like doing that. Too many of us are allowing small things, temporal pleasures, offenses, bad attitudes, bad news, bad reports. We're allowing it to block our view of how massive our God is. So I ask you, what or who is blocking your view? Jeremiah 32, 17 said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and powerful arm, and nothing is too hard for you. You've got to realize that God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he'll do. And if God's word is within you, then your faith will go strong and not weaken. So against all hope, Abraham kept hoping. What are you hoping for and praying for that seems hopeless? Are you blocking God by what you see? So, last night as I'm in here and after my son and husband left, I like to be in here by myself because I can pray loud. You don't have to pray loud, but 
I just, I wanted hell to shake and I wanted heaven to hear and I just wanted to have some freedom and I walked through and I just walked through stretching out my hands. Oh, sovereign Lord, you created the heavens and the earth. You knew this moment and I'm asking you to hear us and I'm asking you to fix some things and I'm asking you to give us boldness and awakening for the word. And as I prayed that, I didn't ask him to remove the negative people. I didn't ask him to remove the people that are sandpaper to me. I asked him to just start awakening, but give me a boldness. Because I'm not backing down. I'm not backing up. I'm not giving up, and I'm not changing. I have a promise. I didn't ask to. I asked God to use me. I asked God to take me where he wanted. God brings us both here because we wanted God to do a work. And I'm not looking at any negative report that the enemy puts in front of my eyes. You've got to remove it and see God for who God is. So you move on into the Bible and you get to Hebrews chapter 6. And again, Abraham's talked about. His promised a son. He waits patiently. He receives. And then you get down to verse 16, and we're reminded of that God does not lie. Now, when people take an oath, this is what you and I do. We call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath. He just didn't need you and I for it. So that those who receive the promise can be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain of God's inner sanctuary. That is your hope. This passage here instills in us a steadfast hope to keep from drifting as you're going from here to glory. God doesn't want you drifting, so he gave you hope. The anchor has been assembled for a very long time since the early church that what it does, it keeps you steady. It's a metaphor that emphasizes God's stability and the safety that we have as Jesus Christ, our hope. We all know the purpose of an anchor on a ship, but yet we fail to live the same way as God and his hope as our anchor. The hope set before us as an anchor of our soul is that Jesus Christ has already gone before us into the holy of holies where God dwells. And that hope is what is going to keep us steady from this life and secure here and then headed over into future glory with him. It is a promise. It is a promise. A promise is an assurance that comes with expectation. You have to believe it. You and I might not be good at keeping promises, but God is. And when he makes a promise, he will carry it all the way through to completion. He endorsed his word with promises. Numbers 23, 19. Balaam is given a message. It's not the message that they're wanting to hear, but you get to verse 19. It says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? In this ever-shifting world of chaos, God's promises is your anchor. When we get a vision of how great and how awesome God is, like we read at the very beginning of this message, your faith will grow. You will never be able to trust in the anchor of hope until you have faith in God's word. You have to have faith and it will give you hope. And Jesus Christ is your only hope. So I'm going to ask you to allow me to brag on Jesus Christ for just a moment. In chemistry, he turned water to wine. In biology, he was born without normal conception. In physics, he disapproved the law of gravity when he ascended into heaven. In economics, he disapproved the law of diminishing 
returned by feeding 5,000 men with two fishes and five loaves of bread. In medicine, he cured the sick and the blind without ever administering a single dose of drugs. In history, he's the beginning and the end. In government, he said he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. In religion, he said no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus had no servants, yet we call him master. He had no degree, but they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet he was called the healer. He had no armies, yet kings fear him. He won military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they just crucify him. He was buried in a tomb, but today he lives. That is your anchor. Some of you are struggling to believe that and worship that because you've not believed in who he is. Isaiah 40 reminds us in verse 18, to whom can you compare God? Just answer that for me. I'm amazed by the things we're trying to compare God to. We try to dumb down God. You won't figure him all out. You can't make sense of everything he says and does. Some of you think, I don't need to be baptized. That doesn't make sense. I don't need the Holy Ghost by speaking another language. That don't make sense. But Jesus said, why wouldn't you want more power? Why wouldn't you want your sins forgiven? Why wouldn't you want your name written in the Lamb's book of life? And then he says, what image, what image can you find to resemble him? Verse 25, he says, to whom will you compare me? Who's my equal? Who is equal to God? As the Holy One. And then in verse 26, look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another. And then he calls them each by name. And I don't think there's any two Angie's in the heavens. I don't think there's any two Michael's in the stars. He has a name for every single star. He calls them by name because of his great power and his incomparable strength. Not a single one is missing. You think you're missing some things in your life, but you're not. God's just got you on a course. If you've submitted to Christ, he's working all things out. Maybe not your way, maybe not your timing, but he's working it out. Verse 29 says, he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. God didn't call his church to be weak, and he didn't call us to be powerless. And God didn't save a B-squad team to take this thing out. We are living, maybe in some last days, maybe the last of the last, I don't know. But I know one thing, God's no less today than when he split a Red Sea for millions to walk through. You've been given a piece of paper this morning. And it says, I have hope in Jesus Christ for. Now this isn't for you to say, I have hope I'm going to get a bigger house. I have hope I'm going to win the lottery. I have hope to lose 20 pounds by next Sunday. But what do you need hope for? I have hope because I'm lonely. I need some hope because I'm uh, frustrated. I'm hurt. I'm wounded. I need hope because I need peace. I'm anxious. I'm fearful. What is it you are needing God's hope for? Because God has hope for you this day. You have a loved one you want to see saved. I have hope for salvation. There's nothing you need that Jesus isn't the hope for. Nothing. Maybe you've backslid. Maybe you're complacent. Maybe you're lukewarm. Maybe you don't have passion or zeal. Maybe you forgot where you came from. There's hope for restoration. There's hope for renewal. There's hope for an awakening. God has hope for you. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to pray over you, and then what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to write that on there. You can fold it up if you'd like, and you can dump it in this jar. No one's going to know it's from you. We're not even going to pull them out. We're just going to leave them in this jar until we pull the cross out next year at Easter. But you have a confidence to know that when you walk down and drop something in, your hope is because of the cross. Your hope is because Jesus is not dead. He's alive. But what he did on the cross was destroy every bad thing in our life and gave us hope. 
And then you can take an anchor. We have this anchor keychain. And wherever you want to keep it, I don't even have keys. I have one key to my office. So wherever you want to keep it, on a windshield, wherever that you're going to see it, when you start doubting, I want you to realize you have an anchor of hope. If you're hoping for what scripture gives you promises for, then he will not fail. I have a reference sheet for you right there. Here's some promises that you can have hope in. And the scriptures are there. God said he will answer while we're talking. Go find that scripture. It's on there. God said he would give us peace. God promises to give us wisdom generously. God promises that no one can snatch us out of his hand. God promises to give our life purpose. God promises that nothing can separate us from his love. God hears our cries, our grief, our loneliness, and our hurt. God promises to forgive us of our sins. God promises to deliver when you're tempted. He promises to be with you always. He promises to give you strength. He promises to rescue you and to protect you. He promises that he will not leave you. And he promises to give you comfort. And the greatest of all is he is coming back. He promises on that sheet are promises just a few not even the exhaustive list exhaustive list he's coming back for you there are promises and scripture references and if you will take god at his word you will see his work performed in your life so i'm going to ask you to stand and whatever you're asking for i'm asking you just to take your paper and raise it to the heavens look, this is an intermission. I'm still talking because I'm still giving you God's word and I'm about to pray a 